Exodus chapter 25. Are you ready? I think God's going to let me talk about some things today. Uh, so bear with me. Let's hang in there. Let's take a little journey uh, through some things concerning kings, kingdoms, and Jesus Christ. Or we could say God and government. Or we could say politics and the Bible. But uh, if, if, we do, if, if, I, if I do it right, and, and what I'm going to try to do is stay above the mire. If, if Christians, if the church is going to talk about things related to the world and governments and politics, it had better do it way above the mud. <clears throat> so that's the plan. We will venture into the realm of spiritual wisdom for citizen responsibility. Where does our belief system meet with our politics? The word politics is not an evil word. The word politics just simply means things related to citizens. Where does our Christian allegiance intersect with our national allegiance? We'll answer that. Uh, we'll talk about some maybe history. Uh, we'll talk about some real analysis from the heart of Jesus. We'll even give some voting tips. I didn't hear not one amen. I, I, I heard not one amen. Everybody is nervous. I can feel you're nervous. Some of you are nervous on one side. Some of you are nervous on the other side. I assure you, this is not going to be normal Christian speak type of message. This is not going to be Fox News, CNN. This is not going to be really the majority of Christian pulpits all over the world. It's not going to sound like that. It's going to, I'm going to try to help it sound like the Bible. I, I, don't, I don't just take every bait that comes swimming by. And neither should you. There's some stuff the world throws. There's some non-scriptural things that are parroted everywhere. When it swims by you, don't bite it. It'll drag you down into the mud. It'll get you away from the Word of God and you won't be able to live right. Or you won't be happy. And so I, I have a right to do this. Because I notice a lot of Christians aren't happy enough. And the way that they talk about politics, they're just not happy enough and they're not correct enough. Uh, what I think we'll get from this is some right perspective and some right identity. You need the right identity. Uh, most preaching on this stuff is very shallow. Most gospel platforms are just complaining about social issues, quibbling about sins, feeling frustrated at the world around them, mostly. Uh, that's not acceptable for spirit-filled Christians. You got to let sinners off the hook. They don't know how to talk about things. Sinners don't understand things. Non-spirit-filled Christians that don't know their Bible real well don't know how to talk about it either. Don't know how to think about it either. Don't know how to deta de detach themselves and disconnect from the emotional side of world issues. But when you get saved and filled with the Spirit, all of a sudden you have the ability to go up and sit with God in heaven. And if you were to sit with God and Jesus on the throne in heaven, uh, you would find out real quick that they're not concerned about any election in any country in any given year. What they're concerned about, what God and Jesus is, are concerned about, is the heart of their people. The wisdom of their people. The freedom inside the, the life of their people. The new nature of Christ being rooted inside their people. That's what they're concerned about. And that's what we're concerned about. So, <clears throat> it's about to get good in here. The ushers have locked the, this is one of those lock the doors meetings. Nobody leaves till we all agree. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. In the, in the Christian's mind, the top problems we face should not be nation problems of bad government, but kingdom problems of Satan darkening the people we're trying to save and Satan hindering God's people from the work. You got it? Do I need to say it again? The top problems we face are not national problems of laws and government and stuff going on. The top problems Christians face is beating the devil off of people that we're trying to save. I'm not taking away love for country. We just need to add some salt and grace to our perspective. We need a biblical worldview that shapes our thinking, that shapes our living, our praying, our, our lifestyle, a biblical worldview. Do you live your life with a biblical worldview? And then I would add this, do you live your life with a New Testament biblical worldview or an Old Testament biblical worldview? Um, if you don't get it straight, you will be a carnal Christian. We don't have any of those around here, but other churches have to deal with that. We need a biblical worldview. Uh, uh, let me say it this way. A biblical worldview, or we say a worldview is the framework from which we all view reality. And, and the way that we make sense of life in the world. Your worldview is the set of instructions by which you determine the proper place for every thought, action, behavior, opinion, and decision in your life. That's your worldview. We all have one. Some people have a biblical one. Some people have the opposite, which is a secular one. Which is the attitudes and activities that have no religious or spiritual basis. You got it? Biblical worldview or a secular one, a not-so-biblical one. <clears throat> a personal worldview is a combination of all you believe to be true. And what you believe becomes the driving force be behind every emotion, decision, and action. Therefore, it affects your response to every area of life, from philosophy to science, theology, economics, law, politics, art, and everything else. Here's the problem. Non-biblical worldviews don't just sit in a book waiting for you to read it. Non-biblical worldviews jump out of the television, jump out of the social media, jump out of every imaginable voice. Even jump out of parents, jump out of those you grew up with. They jump out and try to coerce you a certain way. What that means is we have to be aware and we have to Take effort to get a true worldview. Here are the six specific views of a biblical worldview. Now, they've done surveys for these. They've done surveys to find out how many people have a true biblical worldview. You ready? Here are the six beliefs of a biblical worldview. Number one, that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. That God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe. Number three, that salvation is a gift from God and cannot be earned. Number four, that Satan is real. Number five, that a Christian has a responsibility to share their faith in Christ with other people. And number six, that the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. That's a biblical worldview. Sound pretty good, right? Most people say, yes, amen. The survey said that less than 10% of self-proclaimed born-again Christians have a biblical worldview. Wow. Less than 10%. Wow. That's strange, isn't it? Now, we feel somewhat advanced. We've, we've studied the Bible. We've, we've identified and allowed the Word of God to take root in us. And so these are easy for us. But think of how many Christians are out there that don't have the proper thoughts on those things. 
The survey said that only 51% of pastors had a biblical worldview. And this is not just normal pastors that you would think of and know. This is all denominational pastors and everything. And then here's the stat that said Republicans, can I say Republican? <laughs> Republicans, 10% of Republicans had a biblical worldview. So when we start identifying, let's be careful. Independents, 2% have a biblical worldview, and Democrats, 1% have a biblical worldview. 85% of Christian teens do not believe in absolute truth. We have problems. It ain't politics. How do we know that this could be an issue? Well, because we watch Christians and we watch Christian teenagers they graduate from high school, they shake off all their roots, and they lose their ever-loving mind. <laughs> they go out and try to form their own worldview. That's why colleges are so strung out. It's kids rebelling really against what they grew up with, many of them, uh, or never had any kind of real training. They're trying to develop their real worldview, world but they seem to always start off very rebellious against tradition, rebellious against parents. It's the nature of a teenager. Come on, parents, give me a little amen. The nature of a teenager is to look at mom and dad and say, I can do life better. The nature of a saved, spirit-filled teenager should be to honor their parents. See the difference? But that takes some strict parenting here. And some parents that recognize, you know, we've got to impart this, a real world view, to, I mean, a biblical world view to our kids. A Bible anchor, a Bible stance. We launch our life from the Bible. When, when I got saved, I came into a whole new kingdom. And then I can look at the world properly. Now, what I've noticed is a lot of Christians come into the kingdom and then they come back out. No, 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 no. Come in and stay in. Come in and stay in so that you can deal with the world. Sometimes people seem to get Christianity, put it in their back pocket and say, now let me go fix the world. No, no, I think you ought to stay over here in the kingdom and help other people into the kingdom. Praise the Lord. We haven't started yet. This is just the intro. Because <laughs> I'm going to take a detour on you. And instead of talking about government politics, I'm going to help you uh, take your position first. We have, to, we have to take our seat first in the right spot. We don't want to let people stay out there and try to answer questions. You got to get in. We got to get in the kingdom. We got to start from the proper place if we're going to talk about real life issues that are affecting people. We got to do it from the Christian standpoint. So, in that Christian worldview, in that biblical worldview, I want to add something. We need a church worldview. Do you identify as the church before country? Do you identify with the church before you identify with Dallas Cowboys? Do you identify with the church more than your country of origin? Do you identify with the church more than your education level? More than your friend? You have to identify with the church first. Your first allegiance, maybe, well, your first and primary allegiance would, would be to the church. 
before it was common to say God and country and family. How about if we say God and Jesus and church? Anybody can say God, country, family. How about God and his son and his church? That's what I got saved to. I used to be the other. I know the difference. I got fully in. I didn't dip my toe into the kingdom of God. I jumped in the kingdom. And in the kingdom, there's no political arguments. If you, if you like politics a lot and you enjoy uh, political arguing, uh, that's a hobby. If you like that as a hobby, you keep that as a hobby, but don't bring it into your Christian life. Don't bring it into your Christian purpose. And certainly I've tried to tell preachers, don't bring it into the pulpit. Eventually we are going to talk about some issues like global warming and we're going to look at stuff through the scripture. How can we make sense of some of these things that seem so important to so many people? How do we, we'll get to that, but not today. Let's go back to Christian square one. Let's go back to being a citizen of heaven first. Do, you, do y'all feel like a citizen of heaven first? Yeah. I know you're with me then. Praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> Exodus chapter 25. Here we go. In the Bible, there are three men. These three men were commissioned by God for the same purpose. These three men all did something very similar for a very similar, if not exact, purpose. These three men begin with Moses. Moses in Exodus 25, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering that you'll take. Gold, silver, bronze, all these other items. Verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Do you see that? He told Moses to do what? Make a sanctuary. Build a place. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle, the pattern of all its furnishings. So just just so you shall make it. The first builder is Moses. Three men, all commissioned to build God a temple. Y'all with me? Three men commissioned by God to build a house, to build a temple. In this case, called it a sanctuary, the temporary sanctuary that Moses built for the children of Israel to travel with through the wilderness. Verse 22, and there I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. The purpose of the temple, the purpose of the house was so that God could be there. Second person commissioned to build a temple was Solomon. You recall Solomon's temple was built with stones, right? Moses was temporary. Solomon's was built permanently. First Chronicles chapter 28. Go see that. First Chronicles. It might take you a while. It's Old Testament. You might not know where it's at. First Chronicles. Chapter 28. I'll know you're there when I hear the pages stop. What this means is we have a lot of people that still use paper Bibles. That's marvelous. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 6. Now he said to me, it is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. As you know, David wanted to build the temple. God wouldn't let him because he was a man of war. Here he says that Solomon's going to get to build it. Look at verse 10. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. 
Be strong and do it. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, the, pal- the, the place of the mercy seat, and all the plans by the Spirit. So you got that? Solomon was here to build something for God. Look at chapter 29, verse 1. King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom God has chosen, is young and experienced, and the work is great because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. You see that? Why why did he want the temple built? For God. The temple wasn't for man, it was for God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might gold for the things to be made of gold and silver for the things of silver. Notice, notice what he said. For the house of God, he prepared with all of his might to do this thing. Verse 3, moreover, because I've set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure. See that? Because I've set my affection on the house of God. Two men commissioned to build a place for God's presence. Now we're not talking about physical things. In the Old Testament it was physical. God couldn't dwell anywhere but where the mercy seat was. Anywhere but blood had to be sprinkled on that mercy seat before God could dwell. When Jesus paid the sin sacrifice price, the veil was torn from top to bottom. The Holy Spirit was able to leave. And now the Holy Spirit, or we could say God, can now live somewhere besides a physical building. Where is that? He lives in people now. So we're not talking about physical thing. We're not raising money for the church building. The church building is a mechanism and means to make the other happen. But the ultimate goal is not a building. The ultimate goal is a people. An individual and the next individual and them put together for God to live in. Now, so the third person to build a temple. Commissioned by God to build a place for his name, for his spirit. Turn to Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah, real close to the end of the Old Testament. I know we're getting a little theological here, but you need to understand from the heart of God. You don't get to look at life and government and, and nation without the heart of God, do you? Do you recall over in Isaiah when the Bible says this? It says, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. He's talking about the family of David's father, Jesse. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Remember that? And the word branch is capitalized. Remember that? That refers to Jesus. It's referring to Jesus coming from the lineage of Jesse and David. Zechariah calls him the branch too. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 12 says, Then speak to him saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory and he shall sit and rule on his throne. He shall be a priest on his throne. The council of peace shall be between them both. Three men, Moses, Solomon, and Jesus, commissioned to build a temple. Did you know that? This is why we see over in Matthew chapter 16, when Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, Jesus said, who do you think I am? He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, aha! Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, 
but my Father which is in heaven. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, what's Jesus saying? He said, I'm going to build my church. What's Jesus' commission? To build his church. What's Jesus thinking about today? Building his church. Is he thinking about pandemic policies? Is he thinking about two party elections? What's he thinking about today? Building his church. I signed up for that. I see the importance of that. That's what's supposed to make us glad or mad. And if you're not glad yet about the next person getting saved and trained up in the kingdom of God, then you stick around a while. That's got to be more exciting than winning in some election. Now, at the end of this, yes, you'll know how to vote. But more importantly, you'll know how to live a successful, efficient, effective, happy Christian life. More importantly, you'll be educated in the mind of God. God is an educator. And many people just aren't educated to the things of God. And then if they are, they're not educated to the spirit-filled things of God. Seeing it the way God sees it. Prioritizing the right things. <clears throat> Jesus was called to build the temple. This was something I noticed back 20-something years ago. I was in Jacksonville, Texas. And I was in the foyer of this little church I was preaching in. And on the wall was a picture of Jesus. I mean, it kind of looked like Jesus, I guess. You know, who knows what the real Jesus looks like. <clears throat> but it was a picture of Jesus. And in his hand was a staff. And he was standing in a field of green with some sheep behind him. I looked at the picture and I thought, that picture is not right. I understand that he's the great shepherd and we're the sheep of his pasture. I understand that. Symbolically, it was right. Physically, it was wrong. Jesus was not a sheep shepherd in real life. David was a sheep shepherd. Jesus was not a sheep shepherd. Jesus was a carpenter. Carpenters know how to build. For Jesus' purpose, he didn't need training as a sheep shepherd. For his purpose, he needed carpentry training. Meaning he understands how to lay foundation. He understands the importance of everything being in its proper place. He understands how to put us and set us in the church perfectly. His entire mission was based on him building the church. And why? Why does he need to build the church? Why? Okay, let me quote you these. First of all, the main why so that God can live in us. Solomon built him a house in Acts. It says, how be it the most high does not dwell in temples made with hands. First Corinthians says, don't you know that you're the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Uh, another scripture in Ephesians 2 says, you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. How many of you feel like a fellow citizen here? Yeah. A fellow citizen with saints. How many of you feel that? Amen. We need all Christians to feel like fellow citizens with all the other Christians. Amen. Period. Amen. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. This is first and foremost, the most important thing in our Christian life, to understand that you fit in the church. Don't talk to me about society out there. Once you get saved, you're in. 
And we're all together and we're all in and we're all fitly joined together. And don't you be trying to divide us up. Inside this family is special. We all come from weird wickedness, twistedness out there. Now we're in. Now the glory of God can shine on our face. Now the love of Jesus can permeate every part of us. We can leave all of our stupidity at the door and live inside the kingdom. <clears throat> but then you got to realize the only way to drop stuff at the door is to come in. And that's why you and I can't really help them until they come in. And that's why our ministry to them is Jesus. Because if they don't receive Jesus, they can't come in. If they don't come in, they can't get free. Jesus is building us and he's building us to fit together. First Peter says, you know, Jesus was called a living stone. A lot of churches named Living Stones Church. Because first Peter says, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. You and I are part of a building. And in Solomon's temple, those stones were prepared perfectly to meet the next one. They were carved. They weren't mortared. Solomon's temple stones were not mortared in between. There was no allowance for mistake. Each stone had to be perfectly carved to meet the next stone. You have been perfectly carved to fit in the body of Christ somewhere. Perfectly fit where Jesus wants you. This makes it special. This is something to live for. That's why we're big on church. That's why I'm big on the family of God. To Jesus, it is the most important thing. Back to the Old Testament symbol. Two men in the Old Testament built a temple or a house for God. Why? It says this, so Moses finished the work, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord. You do this right, the glory of the Lord will be here. We do church, any church that does church right, the glory of the Lord will be there. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. Then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house. As we do this right, we experience the glory of God. That is the goal. Christians and countries trying to fix their country is not the goal. Building the house of God, saving people's lives and getting them in for the glory of God is the purpose. So what, what is in the mind of Jesus? I'll tell you this, he's thinking about the church. He's thinking about building his body. We're supposed, to be, we're supposed to be building something. Your time and effort and your hobbies might ought to include building something. Shouldn't our uh, focus be Jesus' focus? Or shouldn't His focus be our focus? It's like I got my Christianity, now let's go fix our country. There's something you can do to help your country. But your priority and your emphasis and your heartthrob better be after the church. Amen. Are we done yet today? I'm going to give you your first voting tip before we're done. You're going to get voting tip number one. After all of this, where does government politics come in? Like, uh, great, that's wonderful about the church. Now show me the political scriptures and the government takeover scriptures and the make your world, more, more, world moral scriptures. Show me those scriptures, please. Sure. 
There must be some. There must be some about harping on all the sins of the world, fighting, fighting diligently against all the sins. There must be some scripture in the New Testament somewhere about fighting diligently against all the sins of the world. No? You'd be hard-pressed to find one. The whole New Testament is filled with wonderful things for us to do, and none of them have anything to do with saving us from the Romans. Listen, the gospel that we preach, the gospel that we live, the attitudes that we have must come from the New Testament of the Bible. And they're supposed to work in every nation. This gospel we do has to work in every nation the exact same way. It's not different. This kingdom is not different from nation to nation. So you and I have to think about what if I was born in Antarctica? Iceland, Greenland, Kenya. What if I was born there? Then what do you think about all day long? Then what do you complain about in the form of government policy? If you're born in another country, all of a sudden, you're not flag-waving so much. Your focus has to be something else. You get saved and it's like, let's grow the people. Let's grow the church. Let's get people saved. Let's spread this gospel. Sure is quiet in here. Don't worry, I'm going to give you a voting tip because we need to vote. You do have citizen responsibility in whatever country you live in. But as a church, you have to understand our thrust. As a church, you have to understand our purposes. Individuals can get involved in all aspects of society. Individuals get involved at work, get involved at play, get involved at, in family and community. Individuals get involved in government. Individuals vote. In, but as a church, you need to get your purposes from church from the mind of Jesus. Your attitudes have to be the attitude of Jesus. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. That'll be our last scripture probably. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. So you ready for your first voting tip? Vote with the church in mind. Your first voting tip is vote with the church in mind. Things that could help us promote the gospel easier. You vote against things that hinder us from freely preaching the gospel. Your first allegiance, my first allegiance should be to whom? To God, to Jesus, and to church. First allegiance to church. Are you with me? Yeah. So you vote with the church in mind. <clears throat> there is one party in every country, really, that hinders the gospel. There's a mindset that develops into a political party that hinders the gospel more than the others. You need to learn who that is. There is one party that's quick to silence Christians, one party that stops prayer in schools, one party that wants to take God off their platform, one, one party that wants to take the mention of God out of courtrooms and Bibles out of classrooms. One party would be glad to revoke religious preference. One party that consistently is the one filing lawsuits against churches. One party is largely secular. Those of us who have a God, believe in God, only need Him. The other party largely sees government as God. But again, the church has to stop its carnal tactics. 
the Christian speak is not really scriptural. We're hearing so often, I've heard it for 20 years, ever since I got in, America better watch out. America better watch out what laws we pass. America better watch out. God's going to punish us. Judgment is coming to America if we don't stop this one and this one and this one. That's not true and that's not scriptural. God is not going to punish America for, for, for not doing the right laws, for not instituting the right attitudes and for not changing. No, no, God's not going to punish America. I said God's not going to punish America. America's not in danger of punishment. The people that say that haven't passed through the cross yet. They're still in the Old Testament mindset where God did punish nations. You pass through the cross, you stand in Christ, and you recognize God's never going to punish Jesus. He's never going to punish His Son. He's never going to punish anybody in His Son. And that's why punishment has been held off. Punishment for nations has been held off right now because there's Christians in every nation. God never in the Bible punished the righteous along with the unrighteous. He always saves the righteous. He always escapes the righteous before he punishes the unrighteous. That would be unjust to punish righteous people along with unrighteous people. I have Bible, I mean, this is Bible pattern stuff. You know, God saved the one righteous family before he flooded the world. The world was evil. One righteous family made it out and then he punished the world. When it came to Israel, he put Israel in the land of Goshen before he plagued Egypt. Before he killed Korah's camp that had come against Moses, he separated all the Israelites, said, get away from Korah's camp. And then he opened the earth and sucked them in. God wouldn't be able to punish America unless all the Christians were out. And that's why we know that punishment is not coming to America until the rapture. After the rapture, then judgment comes. And if you think God is still looking at nations to punish them, then how come are some of those Muslim nations in the Middle East still around? People think, how come God, you know, God punishes cities? If they don't get that sin straight, God's going to punish that city. Every time a hurricane comes through, you, you, you hear it. God's, you know, there's some judgment against Houston, you know, or some, some of these refinery cities. God hates the oil business. <laughs> New Orleans got pummeled by Katrina years ago, and boy, boy, they came out of the woodwork, man. All the judgment freaks came out of the woodwork. God's punishing New Orleans for that old Bourbon Street, you know. But then if you look at it, Bourbon Street was left high and dry. It didn't even flood. <laughs> Churches all over flooded. Bourbon Street left high and dry. And it's, flo it's, it's flying high now. And I always got a question for those judgment lovers. Why is Las Vegas still there? If God is punishing sin like he did in the Old Testament, why is sin city allowed to live? Oh, well, brother, I think it may be because uh, God can't get the hurricanes in far enough. He can't just, he can't get the hurricanes in far enough. See, in, in, inquiring minds want to know. Lo logical thinker, Bible thinkers need to ask some of these questions without just taking hook, line, and sinker everything that comes by. The truth is, you know, the reason it's so easy to keep Old Testament themes when they don't belong anymore is because there's something in us that wants justice. That's a God trait that we want righteousness and justice to prevail. We know that judgment is correct. And it's coming. It's just not here yet. There is a judgment day. But right now you have to recognize God is not sending storms and calamities and catastrophes to punish sinners. He's sending Christians to save them. 
And so when you start looking at your country, don't threaten us with America better watch out stuff. The reason America is safe is because of the salt and life in it. The reason America is such a wonderful place for many people is because of the salt and light in it. And if you want it to be more salty and lit, then we're going to have to do our job. If you want America to really make it, if you want to save America like they say, you better get some more people saved. You better get your Christian purpose intact and go out there and help a darkened sinner get into the kingdom. If we could do that, 300 people would come into the kingdom and that would help. If all churches could do that, then hundreds of thousands of people could come into the kingdom and it would be better. But don't try to solve America's problems without getting people into the kingdom. Don't try to save the nation without Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you're not going to see Jesus Christ on any ballot anywhere. Because he can't be legislated. He can't be voted. We won't lock the doors on you today, but will you promise to come back next week? <clears throat> All right. Last scripture, Acts chapter 1. Are you ready? This is the mighty, the mighty, mighty, mighty passage, final dissertation of Jesus Christ. His final words, we've quoted them hundreds and thousands of times to help people get into the kingdom and be saved and filled with His power. The most glorious expectation was built with these final words. Verse 4, being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Do you realize how magnificent and how monumental this was? Do you realize in your own life, do you remember how monumental it was when you were filled with the Spirit and spoke with tongues? Do you remember the glory that you touched of God when He so preciously accepted you and filled you? Verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What? Right in the middle of the most holy, powerful, thousands of years, God waiting thousands of years to finally do this, thousands of years to finally give His Holy Spirit, all this time, all this plan, all this holy journey to get the Savior to the world, to die on the cross so that God could finally leave that old temple finally leave that little bitty spot where one little person could come see him. After thousands of years, he's finally going to get to go live in people. And they're worried about their natural nation. Well, when are we going to get back our nation? Sounds like American Christians today. I know some of you are mad right now. You're like, what is he doing? What is he, who does he think he is? <clears throat> I don't care. I have a call of God to help people get in the kingdom and live in it properly. Yeah. 
it would be an injustice to Jesus Christ to fall into the same trap as the unbelieving, excuse me, not the unbelieving, the, 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 the Jews. They did not have the Holy Spirit. When they asked this question, his disciples did not have the Holy Spirit yet. He's telling them you're going to get the Holy Spirit. The reason they asked this question is because they were stuck in carnality. They were not born again. They did not have enlightenment. They did not understand things yet. That's why they asked this. Spirit-filled Christians should not be asking it this way. They have an excuse. You don't have an excuse. I can't let us drift back into carnal Christianity. It's no fun. <clears throat> Look what Je They asked the question right in the middle of the holy moment. Look what Jesus says. He said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father's put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, to the, into, the earth, into the earth, everywhere. What did he do? He, he, he sidestepped their question. Uh, it's not for you to know. That's the end time stuff. Here's what they were doing wrong. Isaiah chapter, I'll read it for you since I said it was the last scripture. Isaiah chapter 9, here's why they asked the question, here's why they missed it, and here's why Christians miss it today. We keep trying to skip and go to the thousand year reign of Christ. Here's what it says about Jesus. This is the promises to Israel. This is why they, were, they didn't understand the first coming of Jesus. They, they thought his second coming was his first coming. And so they're waiting for the purple robe king to walk through and take over the world. Jesus is going to walk through and take over the world. Actually, he's going to ride in and take over the whole world. It says verse 6, Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. That's a promise. And it's coming to pass. Just not yet. It's coming to pass when Jesus comes back and sets foot on the Mount of Olives. It's going to happen. He's going to take over the world. We're going to fix every single injustice in the whole world. Just not yet. We cannot skip the dispensation of witnessing. We cannot skip the dispensation of gospel spreading into the hearts of men and go on into the judgment, go on into the government of Jesus' side. But deep down in us, we all want that theocracy. Here's the problem. Christians, deep down, we, want the, we don't want democracy. True Christians do not want democracy. Stop fighting for it. Christians want theocracy. We want God to rule. We want everybody to obey God. We don't want people deciding stuff. We want God to decide stuff. That's valid. That's in us. We're going to get that one day. But we got to be smart. We got to be Bible people. God, listen, listen. God already showed us that it's impossible to make people godly without changing their heart. He gave the law to Israel, but he couldn't live in them. He knew they would all blow the law. Law doesn't solve it. Getting Jesus in the hearts of men is the only hope for anybody and any nation. <clears throat> Glory to God. We'll, we'll talk about how to pray for the nation. We'll talk about some of these things that we know are practical and need to happen, okay? But I, have, I had to start off with right perspective so that we can launch properly. I'm not just going to jump in some other 
muddy place and fight like you hear everybody fighting on the, on the news. What that means is you're going to have to hush a lot of times. Because if you can't give the real solution, don't argue the other one. If they won't let me talk about Jesus Christ, I can't help them. We'll even talk about socialism versus capitalism. I didn't hear any amens or nothing on that. <laughs> one of those is biblical, one's not biblical. So there, there's some wisdom in here that we need so that we can live good, so that we can make best decisions. But at the same time, for Christians, the state of the nation is not our top priority. The state of the kingdom is. Basically, our kingdom purposes should stir us up more than Fox News does. Our kingdom purposes should stir us up more than the local news. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the heathen spiral that our country and any country and any people might be in. But because I'm a Christian, I am more concerned with the individuals in that spiral who are headed to hell. And that's what I keep missing for years and years. I hear the political speak, and I don't hear the concern about a soul. I see people touting politics for hours and weeks and months and years, even from pulpits, and I'm just not seeing their tender, loving compassion for the sinner next door. And I say even during an election year, our hearts should beat, not for turning blue states red, but for turning sinners to Christ, teaching Christians the Bible, building the church of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, let's vote right. Okay? Yeah, let's vote right. See how much time that took? Vote right. It's a small part of your life. Big part of your life is everything else concerning the church and Jesus Christ. The end. I, I trust, I, I trust that, I trust that I made a lot of friends today. I trust that I have no enemies after today. I trust that if I've taken your, your uh, blankie away, that you'll be okay. You gotta let, you gotta let us do this. You gotta let us go to the scripture. You gotta let us present it from a different angle. It'll be, it'll be healthier more, more efficient, you'll feel better about who you are in Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord.